What is up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Up Tempo Podcast. Uh, we have a very special guest here today by the name of Mr. Mikey Matuk, an LSU baseball legend, uh, <laughs> one of my favorites. I uh, remember him starting center field in, in 2009, national champion, uh, wire to wire, uh, one of the greatest seasons in college baseball history. Here with my co host, Dustin Smith. Uh, I know he's got a couple questions for you, Mikey, but first, yeah, man. Sure. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about your podcast, the Mic'd Up podcast and everything, and uh, you covering LSU sports, man. How is that going? Yeah, man. First of all, thanks for having me on here, man. I'm excited. I yeah. uh, I understand the um, grind it takes to have a, uh, a podcast and uh, yeah. be in the media and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, yeah, man, I, I, uh, I, my playing career ended after 2021, mm -hmm. you know, at, at some time, you know, every athlete's career is going to end. A lot of guys don't really know when that's going to happen. For me, I wasn't anticipating it being my last year. I had a really good year um, in 2021 in AAA and thought that going into free agency, I was going to have some opportunities. And, you know, the way life works, the way baseball works, the phone just didn't ring and I didn't get that yeah. opportunity. And so I had to decide on what I wanted to do. And I had started the podcast um, – so it's a YouTube show. We do live on YouTube and we turn it into a podcast. And we started on January 17th of last year. Mm -hmm. And the goal was to create the podcast, create, um, you know, do it, start it during baseball season or leading up to baseball season. Then when I leave to go and play, kind of do the whole JJ Reddick thing where, you know, yeah. I'm doing it from my hotel room or my apartment and I'm bringing guys in. And that was the idea. And then when I come back, go back in the studio and do the whole thing. Well, you know, the way life works, I didn't get that opportunity to go and play um, last year. And so the podcast ended up being from the studio, the YouTube show from the studio, um, three days a week. And, uh, you know, Mic'd Up is obviously a play on my name, but, you know, it's, it's me and my co-host is Jared Mitchell, who I played with here at LSU. And then our producer, Lloyd's kind of a, he's kind of a co-host as well. And so um, it's been very fun, man. I've always enjoyed being in the media. I've always enjoyed doing these types of things. And I was, I was on the other side of it. I was being the, I was getting interviewed. I wasn't doing the interviewing. And so, you know, hosting a podcast and trying to figure out how to navigate through that. It's been a, you know, a challenge and, you know, learning mm -hmm. on the fly, but it's been a lot of fun. And, you know, we do cover a lot of LSU, we, majority LSU sports, but we like to cover, we try to cover everything, right? Like the yeah. ultimate goal is to, to create it and, and kind of bridge the, um, you know, extend our arms to a little bit more of a regional coverage and national coverage of, of other sports and mm -hmm. you know gambling helps us do that we you know we have a partnership with caesar sportsbook and you know so we can talk gambling and that's a way it's an avenue to start talking about other sports and so um uh, it's been a lot of fun man it's it's kept me in the game it's kept me um you know following the game yeah. and uh you know it's given me an appreciation of of a different perspective of the game actually from from a different you know, viewing it from a different way so it's been a lot of fun and uh, you know, if you want to watch it, so we're at, we have a, our YouTube channel is mic'd up, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then uh, we turn that into a podcast and it's mic'd up. It's M-I-K apostrophe D-U-P is how we spell it. And we do it three days a week, six to 8 p.m. on Mondays and Wednesdays. It's live. And then on Fridays, we're kind of in a transition now. Now that February started, we're going to start doing it live on Fridays from one to three, two thirty three. Beauty of digital media. You can do it whenever you want, however long you want. Right. So. Yeah. Um, that's what we do. And then once the show's over, we put it in a podcast. It's very loose, relaxed. You know, obviously everybody's trying to emulate, um, everybody's trying to emulate Pat McAfee, obviously Pat <laughs> yeah. McAfee's, Pat McAfee's uh, personality and his, you know, his character is, is him. And, you know, there's not a lot of people that can do what he do, does, but his style and the way that he has, you know, basically evolved, podcast and YouTube shows. I think mm. that's, you know, something that everybody should, should look at and try to emulate you emulate it, but use your own style. And that's kind of what we try to do. And so it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, Mikey. Uh, the first thing I wanted to start out with saying, man, is, is I've actually watched a couple of your videos on YouTube and, and yeah. I was watching one today at work uh, because I'm a huge Paul Maneri fan, right? Uh, yeah. A uh, huge, just huge LSU baseball sports fan, uh, Alex Box and, and all of the great, uh, memories back in the 90s and and just the gorilla ball and all that stuff man it was just really LSU changed the game of college baseball and Absolutely. 
I just wanted to get your mindset as a freshman walking into, in my opinion, the greatest college baseball program uh, in the country and your mindset to go in there, take a starting job, uh, take a starting job with all of these studs. I mean, we can go back and look at the roster. I mean, yeah. it speaks for itself, man. Um, what was your mentality to go in and take a starting job and win a national championship? So, yeah, so I, I mean, it's, I'm going to try to cut this answer down into as short as I can make it. Cause it's yeah. kind of, there's, you know, there's a little bit of history behind it. Obviously I grew up in Lafayette, Louisiana. So it's an mm -hmm. hour away from Baton Rouge. Bat LSU is a spot that I've always wanted to play. I've always wanted to be here growing up. So my dad played football at LSU. My mm -hmm. uncle played football at LSU. My mom went to school here. This is where I always wanted to be. But I, growing up, I was a football player. I played both. I played everything. Mm -hmm. And baseball and football were always – I always felt like that was, those were going to be my avenues to go out and play at the next level. And, um, you know, my, nobody in my family played baseball growing up or at the level that I had played it. And so whenever I was time to make that decision, I was – I had gone into high school and my first few years of high school thinking that I was going to go and do both in college. And – I had the opportunity to go and do both. I had, you know, a decent amount of football offers, scholarship offers, and every scholarship offer came with a baseball offer, right? They understood that baseball was always part of the equation. And, you know, middle of my senior season of football, I decided I think that baseball, I just wanted to stick with baseball. You know, I was mm -hmm. a raw athlete. I didn't really have – I wasn't as polished on the baseball field. I was good, but I wasn't very – I wasn't as polished on the field as I'd want to be until it – I knew I needed to do a little bit more on the field um, to get to the next level. And so yeah. I, I talked to Jared Mitchell, actually, you know, he is, he was doing both at the time at LSU. I grew mm -hmm. up playing against him and, you know, I asked him and he said basically the same thing. Like if you're going to, if you want to take that next step and you think baseball is your way out, then that's the sport that you need to focus on. Because when you get to college, and I was a quarterback, so I didn't, I wasn't going to have much time to be able to do both. Right. I, mm -hmm. I had to focus on football if I played football. So, at that point, I said, you know what, I'm just going to play baseball. And I walked into coach's office and, you know, Paul Maneri, the one thing you, people can say a lot of different things. You know, obviously a lot of people like Maneri and there's a lot mm -hmm. of, you know, good things that to say about him. Right. But the one thing that nobody can argue is he is always very honest with the player and he's always up front with him. And I respected that. So when I went on my visit, you know, there wasn't he wasn't sure if he was even going to take an outfitter. Taylor Dugal was one of my best friends growing up, We're both from Lafayette. Mm -hmm. He ended up going to Alabama and I ended up going to LSU and, you know, we had always said we we're going to play together, but they weren't even sure if they were going to take an outfitter because they had Leon Landry. They had Jared Mitchell. They had Chad Jones was going to, was uh, supposed to start in the outfield. You had, you know, Ryan Schimpf play a little bit of the outfield. You had Johnny Deshaun, who was a big recruit. You had a bunch of outfielders. So yeah. they just weren't sure. And so when I walked into his office and he was very upfront with me and, you know, I told him, I was like, look, coach, all I want you to do is give me an opportunity and, you know, I'm going to work my butt off and I'm going to put myself in a position to where I'm going to make your job as hard as I can, if I, as hard as I can make it. If I don't play my freshman year, I understand that. That's where I want to be. I know that I can play here. And so he, he, um, you know, respected that and he gave me an opportunity. And so <laughs> I go through the fall and I, it was a rude awakening. And my first guy I ever <laughs> faced in college was Lewis Coleman, right? And so <laughs> Coleman's, Coleman's throwing 94 miles an hour from, you know, crossfire, looking like it's coming from the dugout. And, mm -hmm. You know, we're at the – at this time, we're at the old box in the fall. The new mm -hmm. box was being built. So we didn't get – we didn't move into there into the new box until the spring, like right before uh, the 2009 season. And so, you know, face Coleman and, you know, we had guys everywhere. The team had just went through that big run in 08 and they made it to Omaha. And so they – a lot of expectations in the 09 season. They're mm. pre, we were preseason ranked number one in, in most of the polls. And it was just – it was a lot of hype, but everybody expected it and everybody knew what to, what to expect and what the expectations were. And, and so, you know, I just kind of kept plugging along, plugging along. And so when I got to – I went through the fall. I had an okay fall, nothing crazy. You know, it was, mm. you know, normal freshman fall. And then I go through the break, Christmas break, and, you know, I, I – I, the conditioning program, I followed it to a T and, you know, hit every day. And I want to say, you know, I'm going to go back and I'm going to be ready. Well, when I got back to LSU in the, in uh, January, we had, you know, live at bats and then scrimmages. Well, my first nine at bats, I don't know if I fouled, fouled off a ball. I mean, I swung, <laughs> I swung and missed it. I'm not, I'm not joking. You can ask coach. I swung and missed it everything. And, 
And coach was like, man, I don't know if this guy could play. Luckily, I could run, and I was a good defender. And I could play all three outfield spots. So that was my avenue to travel as a freshman. So I didn't start early on, and we were so good that we were able to beat a lot of teams or teams by a wide margin early on. So I was able to get some at-bats and, um, you know, didn't really light the world on fire when I got those opportunities. And then, um, you know, we played – Chad Jones had to leave to go to football, right? Because they had a new uh, – John Chavis was a new defensive coordinator, mm-hmm. so he had to be there to understand the new schemes, and he couldn't – he just couldn't go back and forth. So it was three and a half weeks of him just at football. So now they need that. There, there's all of a sudden an open spot in the outfield, and we played a um, two-game midweek series against Harvard. And the first game against Harvard we won, it was one of those, you know, midweek games, kind of an overcast, sluggish type of game. And we only won four to three and we played very bad. You know, we're lucky to get out with a win. And so, you know, to make a point, coach basically said, listen, I'm going to put, I'm going to play, play, I'm going to play guys that want to play, that are hungry to play, that don't take their opportunity for granted. And, um, you know, my family was always driving back. And so my mom after the game was like, look, you know, I I don't think we're going to be driving back on Wednesday. You know, it's just, there's a lot going on. You know, we'll be back for the weekend. I was like, no problem. Coach called me that night. Hey, you're starting tomorrow. Call my family. <laughs> hey, I think, I think you'll probably want to come back. And so they flew, they, they drove back. And then the next day, uh, hit two homers and I, I never left wow. the lineup. And so, mm-hmm. uh, you know, coach always gives, was able to give me that opportunity. I was able to take advantage of it, but you know, that next weekend we played Ole Miss with Pomerantz and all those guys and, you know, scratch out yep. a couple hits and it's just, you just have to grind and, and scratch and claw until you start feeling comfortable and, and once, once, once you start feeling comfortable, it, you know, you take that next step and it, and it becomes a lot more fun. Yeah, Mikey, my last one for you before I kick it over here to Dustin, man, is, is uh, I played high school baseball, went on and played some junior college ball here in Alabama. And, man, you know, Auburn goes to the College World Series, and obviously you guys wanted it, Rosenblatt, and, and I've always wanted to make the trip out to Omaha, but I see yeah. the dog pile every single year, man. Uh, what was going through your mind on the final play uh, and you realized that you were a national champion? So we obviously, you know, the, the game, the series was great, right? The first, yeah. series, the first game of the series, we were down by, I think, five runs, and um, we ended up coming back. DJ had a big two-out, two-strike double in the top of the ninth to tie the game, and then I ended up getting the hit in the 11th inning, the go-ahead – RBI single in the 11th inning. We end up winning. The next day, Taylor Young wins on the mound. He absolutely shoves, and we only – I think they beat us 4-5-1. or five to one. And, uh, you know, we go into game three, and, you know, it's, it's you know, the rubber match, and it's, you know, winner take all. And so we uh, – it's a tight game. Jared hits a three-run homer to start the game. Yep. Uh, on game, game three, and the game – I think the score was 4-4 four to four going into the uh, – I think it was the top of the six. I think we're the visiting team. So mm-hmm. it's four to four going in the top of the six, runner on second base. I hit a, a double to, to take the lead five to four. And then we end up piling on. We end up winning 11 to four. So the game was kind mm-hmm. of already, you know, we kind of understood that we were going to win. So we were prepping. Leon was in left. <laughs> I was in center. And, uh, you know, Lewis comes in to close the game, strikes the guy out, does the whole glove throw. And, you know, the his celebration is very reminiscent of, you know, Doug Thompson back in the 90s when he wanted for LSU, he threw the glove and the catcher came and tackled him. And, mm-hmm. you know, so we always watched those videos and Lewis got to replicate that. And I was in the outfield and me and, you know, Leon jump up and do the whole like, you know, side, like, you know, yeah. jump and chest bump or whatever. And so the, my thought was, all right, I got to take my time so that I'm not in the bottom of the pile. I want to be on top of the pile, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I'm running in, I'm running in and like these guys are on the bottom and I'm jumping. I'm thinking like, I'm going to be like the picture, right? I'm in center. <laughs> like I'm the last guy. So I'm gonna jump. Leon had already jumped on. So I jump on Leon jumps off and then jumps back on. And then that's the picture they captured. I'm like, Damn, <laughs> he got me. You know? So, um, man, so it was, uh, it was a lot of fun and it was, yeah. uh, you know, I, I grew up watching that. I got, I got, I grew up seeing the, dog piles and to be a part yeah. of that was was pretty special man it's uh you know one of the best years of my life that's awesome man dustin man i know you got a couple questions yes sir hey what's up mike appreciate you being what's on with on, us man? brother um as an auburn fan last year i interviewed heath kelly he was a infielder on our 1998 world series team they didn't end up winning it but they made a run and it's funny that when i heard you talk bud 
it was a lot of the same things when you talked about like that uh that first moment when you realize because he told a story of David Ross he went to cover yeah. second and David Ross fires one when a guy's trying to steal and he talked about that thing hit his pad you know hit his mitt and he said oh dude uh, uh -huh. this is this is a different level and um one thing that he really talked about man and I wanted to ask you about was well I he, when you go to when you get to postseason play right and you start playing these big time games. How much does the gauntlet that is the SEC slate throughout the season prepare you for that? Because every weekend you've got heavy hitters coming in. Yeah, no, I, and I mean, that's a great question because, you know, back then, obviously the SEC has always been strong and it's always been one of the mm -hmm. top conferences in, in college baseball. Over the last five years, I think they've taken that to the next level, right? I think the SEC mm -hmm. now is better than it's ever been as far as talent. And, I, you know, part of that has to do with, the way the draft is structured now and some guys are coming back to school that maybe should have gone to the draft and, you know, NIL and all this transfer mm -hmm. portal. So you're getting all mm -hmm. the talent is being accumulated right now in the SEC currently. Right. But, yeah. you know, rewind a little bit to when we were there, it still was just as good. And I like to equate it to, um, and I'm going to get to your, the answer to your question, but I like to equate the SEC back then, right. If you would talk to scouts and you talk to other people like, Oh, you know, SEC, competition is equivalent to you know some people were going to say double a back then i would say it's equivalent to and we talked a little bit about this yesterday on, on our shows so i think that the sec back then was probably equivalent to high a right you mm -hmm. had the three starters your friday and your saturday night guy were bona fide stars right now your sunday guy were good they were draftable like our sunday guy was austin ross he was a third rounder like he was he was mm -hmm. very good right so you have that capability now the difference and the lineups are solid the difference between, you know, high level minor league baseball and the SEC at that time was the bullpen, right? You'd have one or two guys out the pen that you can always count on. You had maybe a couple of guys that could throw hard, but you didn't really know where it was going to go. It wasn't as consistent. You know, you get through those two guys, it, it, it dropped off a lot. Right. So that was the difference. Now, I mean, you look at LSU right now, they don't have one guy out there pen that's throwing, you know, under – I say I want a guy. There's not many guys on their on their pitching staff right now that throw under 95. Mm -hmm. And so now I think that you've they've, you know, the way with technology and training and how understanding how to throw the ball harder, you know, you don't have that anymore. So I think now the SEC is more equivalent to double A as far as, you know, talent and, and velocity. Mm -hmm. Now that, that's a combination of the talent and the SEC and a combination of how the minor leagues are structured now, right? Teams are moving guys a lot faster through the minor league. So mm -hmm. these top tier talent guys that are in double A aren't there for long. So now you have the, a little bit more of a development side in double A on some of the guys that probably, you know, the guys that don't really need the development, they get pushed. And so I think that now the talent level in, in the SEC is very equivalent to double A, right? The bullpens are very deep. You have a lot of guys that are throwing really hard. And now you look at lineups and you have, you know, in LSU's lineup alone, you probably have three first rounders, maybe four first rounders in this lineup. Yeah. And so when it's all said and done, and so, um, you know, it's, it, it goes to like, and back to your question, like the gauntlet, obviously going through that, I always said, and this is a little biased on my side, but some, I always said sometimes going into playing in the SEC tournament is tougher than playing in Omaha. Now you, yeah. it's tough to get to Omaha. Yeah. It's tough to get to yeah. Omaha. Right. But like when you get to the SEC tournament, you're playing against, all the all the top tier teams. I mean, SEC's got six out of ten in the top ten. Or yeah, seven and they got you scouted too, 10. right? They got yeah, scouting they reports know, on they, you they've too. They've seen you. They've mm -hmm. they, they've been around. And you know, now with TV, every game's on TV. It's a, little, a lot easier to scout the opponent if you even out of conference. But yeah. you're playing these teams that are very familiar, and there's a lot of rivalry, and it's, it's very intense. You're staying at the same hotel, and so I always said that the <laughs> SEC tournament is a lot more difficult to get through than Omaha. Now, obviously yeah. Omaha is a bigger stage. It matters more when you get there. And so, you know, I may be a, little, a, a tad biased towards that, but it's your question, man, the, the SEC is a deep, deep, deep conference. And so getting through it, you know, it makes the, the postseason run a little bit more um, salvageable because yeah. of the, of the difficulty of the regular season. Mm. Right. Buddy. Um, I've spent some time on that LSU campus, actually, right out of high school. i got some people in my family that are LSU Tigers, and nice. uh, I guess um, <laughs> <laughs> it's war damn over here. But now we're far enough away from your career because uh, my best yep. friend is a big LSU Tiger. I That 2009 season, I heard all about mm -hmm. y'all, brother. Trust me. 
We're far uh, enough away now. I can admit, I liked you. You're one of my guys. I appreciate even. that. I appreciate <laughs> that. I appreciate but, uh, that. I can take it. I hear it. I, I, I heard it just today, man. The expectations for this year's LSU baseball team. You mentioned the high picks that the, you know, the first round picks y'all got just in that rotation and that lineup. What, what are the expectations this year? Is it college world series or bust? It kind of seems that way coming from y'all's fan base. Yeah. So when you come to LSU, yeah, that is always the expectation, right? Mm -hmm. Last year was the first year and a very, very, very long time that if you went to LSU and you didn't stay for four seasons, you didn't make it to Omaha. So up until last year, if you mm -hmm. went to LSU and you played for four years, you went to Omaha at least one time, mm -hmm. right? Which is, that's mm -hmm. very hard for some programs it's to impressive. say, right? So when you come to LSU, yep. the expectation is always Omaha or bus, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, people talk about, well, they're, you know, they consensus number one team in the country. They've been, you know, they've kind of swept the number one ranking in all of the polls and all of these types of things. And, you know, I, I don't think that, that ex, those expectations are unwelcomed. I think that when they yeah. came here and they, they went into the season and they brought all this talent in, they understood what the expectations are and they are ready for that challenge, right? They don't, they don't talk about, oh, man, I hope that we are, you know, we're going to win. And, yeah. You know, it's like, hey, this is the expectations. We want those expectations. We want the target on our back. We're going to go out there and we're going to play the way that we know that we're capable of playing and we're going to allow that to fall the way it went like when we we're in 09 we were we were number one team in the country preseason two of the four polls the other two we were number two right mm. we knew coming in that we had a lot of returning guys they had just made it to omaha and so we knew what the expectation was and we embraced that and so we allowed that to be um a motivator but also it it, it didn't distract us from the ultimate goal right if we if i knew that if we went out there and said we're going to do what we're supposed to do and we're going to play the game the way that we know that we can then the other stuff is going to work itself out right you can't say oh i know i gotta win every game or i gotta yeah. win every series or we gotta go and do this and i know it sounds cliche but that's kind of what we did right like hey we think that we're the best team and we're gonna go out there and prove that we're we didn't sweep many people we only swept one series in conference and that was auburn sorry yeah. <laughs> that year right and yeah. you know every other series we just won we won two out of three and and we just we plugged along and and, and mm -hmm. we we did our thing man and so i think that this team kind of has that same mentality and um, you know, talent wise though, like as far as comparing the 09 team to this team, I, yeah. I think that, um, uh, you know, offensively, I think that we are very comparable, right? Like mm -hmm. I think that the guys that we had in our offense in 2009, um, were very comparable to the guys that they have. Now we didn't have a number one overall pick. I think that they have, I think Dylan Cruz, potentially yeah. they have three guys that are going to battle this year for the number one overall pick. Uh, or two guys on the same team, which is, you know, Dylan Cruz and Paul Skeens. And you have mm -hmm. uh, Chase Dollinger from Tennessee, who is obviously in the mix. There's some other guys too, but Skeens and and um, Dylan Cruz are on the same team, right? So obviously we didn't have a guy that was the number one overall pick, but we had, um, I think, three or four first rounders in that lineup, or three first rounders in that lineup. Plus you had LeMahieu, who was a second rounder, who was obviously, yeah. you know, an all-star yeah. and, and, and who, how good is he? Had. But, you know, our starting pitching, you had Lewis Coleman was our ace, right? And you had Anthony mm -hmm. Renato was our, our, our second ace. Yep. And both those guys won 14 games. Um, and then you had Austin Ross, who was a very, very capable third starter. Like I say, he was a third rounder. I think where this team separates themselves from us is their pitching depth. They mm -hmm. have five guys that you can put in that rotation that are very, very explosive, right? People don't even talk about Blake Money, who's been there for a couple of years. And, you know, you talk about, uh, Paul Skeens, and you talk about Ty Floyd, who's been throwing 95 to 97 in the fall. You talk about Grant Taylor, who's throwing, who's sitting 97. You talk about um, Thatcher Hurd, who transferred in from UCLA, UCLA. who's projected yeah. top 10 pick next year, right? Then <laughs> you, you talk about uh, Little from Vanderbilt, who Vanderbilt, yep. just got over a, uh, mm. a, a elbow. He had a um, little cleanup deal in his elbow, nothing crazy. In the fall, he was 93. Now he's sitting 95, 97. Mm. You, know, you have that guy. Then you have Blake Money. And then you have all these this ability on the mound. And we didn't have that depth. We Now, right. our number one and number two were as good as anybody. But they have five guys that you can rotate in and out of, mm -hmm. of that weekend rotation. I think that's kind of where they separate themselves from where we were. Now, obviously, you have to go out there and win. Like, that hype is great and, and expect, expectations are great. 
but expectations don't mean anything unless you go out there and mm-hmm. you win and you and you get to Omaha and you win the World Series, right? And that's you know obviously Tennessee was was extremely talented last year and they only had, they had single digit <laughs> losses and you know they I'm not I'm not like trashing them, right? That's yeah, just, but that's just the way it goes. You can't consider mm-hmm. yourself the best one of the best teams of all time unless you go out there and you win, right? And so Thank you have to go out bro. there and you have to you have to go and win win games, right? Bregman and those guys out here, they only had eight losses in 2013. They went one and two in Omaha, and, mm-hmm. you know, they didn't win. Like, they were very talented. They are very good, but they didn't go and win, win the whole thing. And so it's hard to put yourself in that upper echelon unless you go out there and do it. So, you know, I talk to these guys. I'm like, man, like, y'all have all these expectations. I think y'all are very good. I think y'all have a chance to be the best team ever in the history of LSU talent-wise. Ooh, wow. You have that ability wow. to do that. But mm. you have to go out there and do it. You know, you have to go out there and play, and I think that they embrace that, and they're looking forward to it. Blake, can I sneak in a football question real quick? Yeah, man, go ahead. Go ahead. So I, I watched your Walker Howard video today. He has some mm-hmm. interesting takes there on that situation. I kind of trust what you're, what you're saying when you're close to the kid. Um, I want to ask, though, does Jaden Daniels hold on to the starting QB job next year, or does he even <laughs> win it in the spring or in the fall, I mean? So, yes, I think he uh, it is his job. Mm-hmm. You know, I like to say it's his job to lose, right? So – I think he's going to go through the spring as a starter. He's going to start the season as a starter, mm-hmm. right? Now, if he goes out there and he doesn't show the adjustments that he needs to show, right, to, to take LSU to that next level. Because, listen, they won 10 games this year. It's a season that nobody anticipated them having. He was yeah. a big reason for that. He won a lot of games for them. You know, people got you know a little spoiled because they started winning and they expected more and more and more and more. And I think people got it a little spoiled with Joe Burrow, right? There's only one Joe Burrow. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to have a guy like that again. Yep. It's very rare to have a guy with that anticip- anticipation, cool. with the ability to uh, assess the defenses and the ability to have a control of an entire offense the way he did. Yeah, That's a very rare thing. Reason why he's doing the same thing now in the NFL, right? But mm-hmm. what Jaden Daniels did, Jaden Daniels has the second – he's the second best quarterback in the history of LSU according to stats, right? His season last year was the second best singles – season as a quarterback from anyone as far as like total offense touchdowns responsible for obviously Joe was number one and and uh Jaden's number two and so you know obviously to, to take LSU to that next level would mean hey you have to be able to stretch the field vertically you have a mm-hmm. bunch of you know badass receivers out there that can go out and get it you have mm-hmm. to be able to utilize those guys and stretch them vertically and not just horizontally and I think that he knows that and I think that Brian Kelly and them know that and He's, yeah. It's not that he can't throw because he can yeah. do it, right? He showed that he can do it. It's just a matter of, hey, let me get more confidence in myself. Now, if he doesn't show that and the offenses start to sputter, look, you're going to have a huge test first game of the week. You're going to have a top 10 team uh, or top 10 matchup with LSU and Florida State opening game of the season in uh, Orlando, right? Like you're going to have revenge. a – Yeah, you, you would hope, right? And yeah. So you're going to see – you're going to see really quick if they've made the adjustments. And you're going to have – I mean, they have – you know, full, they have two, another season under their belt, right? Mm-hmm. This is the first time they've all been together for a full calendar year. So I expect you to see the adjustments. Um, if he doesn't make those adjustments, obviously you have Nussmeyer waiting in the wings. He showed what he can do towards the end of the year. Um, and Nuss loves LSU, and he does, he's not going anywhere, obviously. So he's, he'll be yeah. the quarterback after Jaden. If Jaden goes down and gets hurt, he's the guy. If, if Jaden ends up not being productive, I don't think Brian Kelly's – shy uh, or scared to put to put us in but to answer your question i think yeah. Jaden is the guy and i think Jaden is um the guy until he proves he's not well mikey man uh one more quick one before we let you yeah, get out sure. of here man um i just wanted to ask you i know with jay johnson and the job that he done uh, in the transfer portal man uh and going and getting tommy tanks from nc state man i just think that's a huge pickup but i gotta know man who hits more tanks this year in that that's lsu lineup a, that's a tough question we that's that's a that's a conversation we also had yesterday right not necessarily <laughs> yeah. who's gonna hit the most i think you know and my coach jared mitchell said that he thinks that this team could potentially have three guys on their team this year that have 20 plus homers Right wow. now, yeah. who would three? We don't, you don't know, right? There's a, there's a combination of a bunch of guys that can do it. Yeah. Um, man, I, I really think that, I really think Dylan hits the most this year. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's going to be, you know, Dylan and Tommy are going to go, you know, neck and neck. And, you know, I hope they get into a home run race because that's good for the team and that's good for, you know, yeah. the more, the more homers you hit, the more runs you score. Um, so I think that 
you know, I think Dylan's going to hit the most this year. Now it may be, you know, 26 and 25 or 27 mm -hmm. and 26, whatever it is. Um, but I think Dylan does that. I think he's going to end up, I don't know, but I think he's going to end up leading off. So he's going to get some more at bats. He's going to have some opportunity and it's going to be hard to pitch around him with the guys you have behind him. So I think he's going to get that opportunity. And I think he's, you know, he's been in the league for a couple of years. So uh, he understands these guys. He's familiar with these guys. You know, Tommy is very, very good. And I think he's going to have a great year, but you know, he's going to have to adjust to the guys that he sees, right? It's the first time you see a pitcher, it's a little different. You know, the, mm. the more times you see him, the yeah. easier it is. And so he's going to have to um, adjust to that a little bit. And I don't think it's going to be a hard adjustment, but you know, it's going to be adjustment nevertheless. Love that. Well, Mikey, man, we appreciate you joining us. Yeah, and, thank you, uh, bud. Oh, man, I'm glad, I'm glad to be here, man. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Uh, if everybody could, go go plug away Mikey show. Go listen Please. on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever yeah. you can find him. Uh, yeah. Great guy, Mikey. We appreciate you Thank once you. again. And uh, for that, this, this episode is coming to an end. We appreciate each and every one of you who listen, and we will catch you on the next one. We're out. Appreciate you guys.